Welcome back to the Black Techies Podcast, where black culture meets the world of technology. I'm your host, David, aka Just Process YT. Follow me on Twitter. You can also follow the Black Techies on Twitter at the Black Techies. Uh, as, as always, if you're if you're watching on YouTube and you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, hit the bell next to it. So next time you have we upload something, you will get it first thing when it uploads. All right. Uh, if you're not, if you're listening to us, make sure you're uh, subscribed on whatever podcast app you choose we're, we're everywhere apple apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, spotify all of them all of them were there just just google the black techies like seriously google the black techies i will guarantee we're the first hit so uh <laughs> but uh if you're watching this you can you see the title and this is part two of our discussion about esports and hbcus and we're very happy to, to welcome back mr john cash from johnson c smith university uh, sir, welcome back to the podcast. How have you been doing? I'm doing. I'm blessed and highly favored. I am thankful and I'm safe. And so are my family. And I hope you guys are doing the same in our new normal. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully not the permanent normal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, um, I mean, just being, you know, just as a side note before we really get started, you know, if you're an HBCU supporter fan, you know, enthusiast, this stuff hurts because, you know, right around this time you prepping for, you know, for the for fall sports to come up, you know, homecomings, bands, tell your friends not to invite you to weddings, you know, all sorts of stuff. So it's, yeah. you know, the new normal is right. And I think uh, this kind of ties into the conversation that we're about to have because, it's forced our communities to adapt. And that's something that uh, traditionally our schools have had to do out of necessity. And um, it's interesting that we're having this conversation at this time because esports is an industry that has quite frankly gotten here at the right time in the right place for HBCUs. And, uh, and since the last conversation we had with Professor Cash, there's been a ton, I mean, a ton of movement in terms of our footprint in that industry and our, you know, that effort to make that footprint really, really visible and significant. So um, without further ado, you know, Professor Cash, take it away. <laughs> Let us know what you've been working on, what you've been involved with. And we'll add on to it. Yeah, yeah. That's, I want to. I'm interested because I haven't kept up with it as much as I probably should. So enlighten me. <laughs> like what's been going on? Yeah. Well, thank you guys for the Black Techies for having me today. Uh, what you guys do is great. I want to make sure that we can amplify what you're doing. So I want you to take note that we need to follow up on what success looks like for you with your show because I can talk to some folks and, and look at doing some things. Within the HBCU eSport arena, the ecosystem, it is literally blowing up. Of course, um, and, it's being, and, and it's being amplified because of COVID, and just like I knew, it's shutting down fall sports. I mean, there's two things this country understands, money and violence, and now the money is being impacted, and that's why the, eight, the SEC, ACC, and who? Big 12, they're holding out to the bitter end, uh, probably the end of this month before they make a decision on fall sports. But as you've probably seen in the last two weeks, I believe every major HBCU conference has canceled fall sports and possibly moved football to the spring, with the exception of the SWAC, unless I missed that. And uh, we have an ASU graduate here, so he might know a little bit more about that than I do. So I'll pause yeah. there for a second before I get started. Yeah, I think the, I think the SWAC is um, about to make that move. I know from some of the news I've been seeing in the last day or two, um, they're effectively, you know, uh, about to cancel fall sports or postpone them until the spring. Or at least they were, the, they were really the only conference that had that advanced plan um, in place. Uh, you know, out of all the conferences that are at FCS or FBS level. So mm -hmm. um, that's something that we kind of saw coming down the pipe. Now, I think 
it, this is very important that uh, Professor Cash pointed, you know, the landscape out because ordinarily, under ordinary circumstances, this would be devastating for a lot of smaller HBCUs. And in some senses, in some, you know, instances it is because, you know, we rely a lot on that type of social interaction and the social and economic income that comes with those fall athletics, which is why what's been happening in the esports realm for HBCUs in general has been so exciting. Um, the one thing that immediately comes to mind, what we've seen happen the last couple of days, uh, has been involving the MIAC, and the MIAC essentially has kind of jumped in feet first with um, with Blaze Gaming, and they are sponsoring an esports league. Um, and this is not just an individual tournament. This is not, you know, one time deal with one game or two or whatever. They're actually sponsoring teams per university, per league that's going on right now in terms of registration. And, you know, for those that are heavily, you know, those that listen to us that are gamers out there, I mean, all, all the usual suspects, Call of Duty, Madden, you know, Madden, uh, you know, Madden 2K1, FIFA, um, Rocket League, even League of Legends and some of the more popular role playing games, they are fully committed to making that happen, which is exciting to see, to say the least. Um, the SWAC is, you know, they announced something prior to that, uh, but this was more, lo- more along the lines of a localized type of tournament that would occur in conjunction with, um, with the next SWAC tournament or the next SWAC um, championship uh, weekend. And that was also school-based. I uh, believe it was for some of the same sm- um, some of the same sporting games like uh, Madden and um, FIFA and 2K. Um, that has been really really cool to see, uh, particularly since the last time Professor Cash was on and how excited we all were to see Johnson C. Smith, you know, really be the spearhead of that of that type of visibility with their program and. Mm-hmm. You know, to see the jump from that moment when we did that podcast to now is incredible. And I'm I'm really excited to hear, you know, about what else is happening in just in addition to what we've been seeing. Sure. Um, I'll start off with Johnson C. Smith, uh, since that's why I'm getting a little bit of bread and butter right now. We are very thankful again for the leadership of President Armbruster, as well as our dean, and then also Dr. Williams. I came, it was about, it was still less than a year ago, and I really came through the fruition that this is something we can do. So again, our whole program is still less than a year old. But what I would like to announce now is that we have the JCSU eSport Gaming Trifecta. We have a full-blown course, curriculum, and certification program, as well as we just secured our eSport club, on campus, and we're finishing and building out our eSport lab, which will be able to house 24 gamers at one time. Now, the one thing we're looking at is the backbone to support that, so the internet and connectivity and everything. But we're very excited to be able to launch this opportunity for the students and all the partnerships that we are starting to uh, develop. So that's the first big thing, and we're very thankful for that. The other thing I would like to share is that we have established along with Insights Marketing led by a young lady named Keisha Walker, FAMU grad. I've known Keisha for at least 15 years, back to our corporate days. She has done a lot in, with, um, in the entertainment uh, space and we have collaborated and she has launched the Black College Gaming Association. This is a consortium of, East, of, of HBCUs that are playing in the esports space now, and is and it was like it was like epiphany because I had the same idea about two months ago. Keisha called me literally uh, contacted me about five weeks ago, and has blown it out. So the goal is is to empower esports student uh, empower our HBCU students interested in esports. So we'll be focusing on education, 
internships, career placements, and advocacy within the industry. We are brand new guys, less than two months old. So we're we're walking, you know, we're, we're crawling, walking, running, but we are being established. The goal is to secure approximately 20 uh, interested HBCUs, vet that number to 14. And so there are several HBCUs out there that are in the midst of either developing curriculum, finalizing curriculum, uh, maybe working on e-labs. They have existing e-teams, one uh, e-clubs, excuse me, e-sport clubs. One has an e-sport team. And again, shout outs to what API and Ike uh, Reese did, Isaiah, with uh, um, the MIAC. I know Isaiah, met him last year uh, after the White House HBCU in uh, initiative. And he was up there, and I know that he sat in on the eSports uh, initiative. So I did that. Shout outs to Derek Weber, who was leading the uh, SWAC's eSport uh, tournament initiatives that were supposed to be tailored around both the SWAC football and basketball tournament championships. So again, with football season being on the bubble, we'll see what looks that looks like. But at Johnson C. Smith, we have a big announcement coming very soon. I wish I could share it right now regarding esports <laughs> gaming, bigger yeah. than the trifecta that I just shared with you. Well, not bigger than that, but as exciting as that. But that's coming very soon. Man, I wish I could mention it now. But I have to hold off, but we should be able to be able to mention it in approximately within the month before school starts. So more great things from Johnson C. Smith and esports and gaming. And we are truly building up our ecosystem. And when I say building up, put it this way. I have relationships now with Riot, Activision, Blizzard, EA, um, and working on NBA 2K with decision makers. And then with a top headphone producing uh, company, they're going to be providing us uh, in-kind headphones. So a lot going on in the space. And the beautiful thing is, is uh, revising the curriculum and keeping the curriculum contemporary, whether it's the business of esports, whether we're looking at media, whether we're looking at project management and program management. Those are the things we want. It doesn't matter to me really what's in a book or a textbook or what I think is important. What's important is what the industry is dictating, what developers and publishers want, what these project managers want for events like DreamHack or whatever, what people want to do to become professional gamers. Those are the things that are important and, and it's just taking root. I shared with you guys before, this is like the Oklahoma land grab. And it is. The, the gates yeah. are open, the horses are running out, and hope and our goal is that the Black College Gaming Association helps put a context around this that we can help out with. So I'm gonna pause right there. Um, and then I'm going to get into another subject to get you guys feedback. But I think things are robust, but we're all HBCU graduates here. And I think just traditionally, from what I've seen, I went to an HBCU, I teach at an HBCU. We are more deliberate. When you look at our PWI brethren, they haven't been as deliberate. They understand we're making revenue and we're getting more students. And we're doing something that's going to to activate us more. I still go into conversations. People ask me, "What is esports gaming?" Um, it's an international, multi-billion-dollar industry. When you when you put both the esport and gaming piece, that's 150 billion dollars pre-COVID um, expectations right now. Yeah. So it's a lot more education for whatever reason that we have to go through. Um, but I, I, you can tell by my enthusiasm and what I've shared that we are crawling, walking, and running. Yeah. Let me, uh, so I, I, well, first I want to say congratulations, and I look forward to hearing uh, the next big announcement from, from you all. And I, I think this is probably, this is, this is huge right now because we're, we're kind of at a crossroads right now. I mean, you have, you know, COVID going on right now. And so this is, probably the best time to start up anything doing doing with esports because i mean you can socially distance with esports <laughs> if yeah. you really wanted to i mean you can you can do it from home i mean uh the the nascar league i think most a lot of those drivers they have their own little uh setups at home and they compete over the internet <laughs> uh in in the in the nascar leagues and so you know this is 
I think this is the best time to do this. You know, I, I was listening to a um, a podcast, or I forgot what it was, and they mentioned that you know today we have like new media, right? We have uh, the internet, we have YouTube, and uh, when you ask children, not children, when you, when you ask <laughs> like high schoolers maybe or m- middle school students, you know, what do you want to do when you graduate, or what do you want to be when you grow up? Oh yeah, even even kids. A lot of them will say, I want to be a YouTuber, I want to be an Instagrammer, or I want to I want to go into esports because they see people like Ninja or Courage or like or Dr. Disrespect, or even though he's kind of in some trouble right now. But uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, like they see all these people making money or just being successful, or just doing something that they love and it's like, well, I want to do that now. I, you know, I want to do that too. You know, if I can be successful on YouTube, just filming something on my smartphone. If I can, you know, get a budget camera and live stream myself on Twitch and get a bunch of followers and uh, affiliates and sponsors, you know, why not do that? <laughs> so I think that the fact that you're that you all are doing this right now is. Like this is this is the best time, and I think, and I'm really glad that you all are doing this now, and I hope that it catches on. And I, I'm interested in seeing, and I don't know if you're able to release the list of schools who have signed on, but I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm this I'm tempted to, to call up TSU and A and T and just call them and like, hey, Alabama State, yeah, right? I mean, well, I'm a <laughs> yeah. I can't give the list right now, but I I will talk since I I can share this as basically public knowledge that. Um, I know TSU was in the eSport uh, gaming space uh, through some things that I've heard and seen recently. So they are definitely in the space. Uh, there are other universities doing things. FAMU has a good team. They have some things going on. Texas Southern University has some yeah. things going on. Um, Lincoln University and outside of Philly has some things going on. North Carolina Central has their things. Hampton had a change with, um, I think, changeover on some personnel, but I know that they're still working on initiatives. Kentucky State University has things going on there. Um, they've converted a lot of their opportunities, but they have uh, courses and curriculums coming on board, on board. Um, I'll even shout out uh, a brother of mine, Dr. Mark Williams. He's at Florida Memorial. Memorial University. He's about to start a program there. Morehouse, like I shared, has a very good esport, one of the first esport clubs that's really been gaining traction. So a lot of contact out there. I want to take a brief moment to address the perfect opportunity. Again, I'll share this thing that really just came to light with me. History is rarely historic when you're in the middle of it. And that's how I feel about HBCU and esports and the impact that it can have on the African-American community. Um, and so we're doing it. We don't. There, there's a whiteboard and nothing's on it because this is all new for us. But I feel that it, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, share that this is also about service and empowering others. And so I'm just going to take a quick moment to highlight community, spelt with an X, C X M M U N I T Y, because X is the only letter that you can find on both a keyboard and a controller, and we use that intentionally because we never want to leave anyone out. Communities non, is a nonprofit, and the focus is uh, to empower underserved communities by providing technology to K through 12 and HBCU students. And we're proud to keep growing. Our program, our initial program was May 2nd and 3rd. We did approximately less than uh, almost two days worth of programming, uh, streaming on Twitch, front page of Twitch, was, as you know, guarantees you 250,000 viewers right there. Uh, we were able to raise funds and distribute those funds. And we've had subsequent tech for COVID events, usually three, four hours uh, over the past couple of months. And now we're changing it. We're rebranding it to Tech for Good. The next one will be held on August the 2nd, probably from 3 to 7. But this is the big drum roll. We actually are developing and have activated the first student-led HBCU tournament featuring seven HBCU schools with JCSU in there, and they've been practicing on Call of Duty. And JCSU has been kicking butt in the practices so far. And that's coming from the people leading there. That's right. They've been kicking butt (laughs) in Call of Duty. 
Uh, so shout outs to the Golden Bulls. But um, I don't want to be remiss in missing the other schools. But again, you can always Google Tech for Good and Community. Uh, www.communitycxmmunity.co and uh, check out what we're doing. And again, this is student led. So think about it. Our students are leading a league activity. They're doing the project management. They're putting together the, the, the scheduling. They're helping out with the resource center where we're running out of, which is Access Replay in downtown Atlanta. It's a 12,500 square foot facility for co-working and esports primarily. And so we're really excited about that and we're getting some great sponsorships. Again, more to come on that, but I had to share what our students are doing, that this will help differentiate themselves and make them more marketable in the marketplace. And actually, in, in case, JCSU has two players who do want to go pro, who want to be pro, uh, pro uh, gamers. And the fact that they're kicking butt right now might be a sign. So a little bit, a little bit I wanted to share about giving back to community and what we're doing. And um, to, to really bring this home, through Tech for COVID and community, of course, I was able to secure, uh, working with them, 25 computers for JCSU underserved um, student HBCU student athletes. And we can't boil the ocean, guys. I'm not going to sit here and say that. But we're trying our best to make a difference in education, especially with tech for COVID. And now you know these kids going back to schools, let alone the teachers, is scaring the crap out of me. And I feel that you're going to get students on campus or you're going to get students going to school and they're going to have to close everything right back up because we haven't been doing things as a society in the last four months that other parts of the world are doing and basically have flattened and declined their uh, COVID situation. So it is really imperative. And I share with anyone out there, if there's anything you can do to help students with remote learning, laptop, it's not just providing laptops, what have you, they need mobile hotspot support. A lot of our students don't even have access to internet and so they're, they're really lacking. And we, I don't have the answer to that, but I know that everybody, if everybody does a little something, it helps everyone. Maybe you can do a, a three-person social distance course at a house so that student can get access to online. So I just want to share that with people as we get ready to go back to school and take care of our students and our teachers. Yeah. I think that was, um, well, first, all of that is really, really exciting news. And the fact that we, you know, the list of schools that you kind of ran off there, um, you know, it's kind of got me hyped already to see, you know, just what kind of products they put out um, in terms of where they're going to be at in the space. I think the other thing that came from uh, the MEAC news that was released um, in terms of them putting together a league was that inclusion of folks that are outside of a student body um, is going to be big. Um, in other words, it's, you know, people that are trying out don't necessarily just have to be students. They can be students, supporters of the school, staff, alumni, which is absolutely incredible in terms of exposing um, a lot of demographics to not only the, the sport of esports, but to the industry and potentially getting people to think in a long, in a little bit different way in terms of, you know, their introduction, introduction to the industry and in terms of what it could mean to communities that might not necessarily see that type of exposure. So, you know, what the MEAC is doing in terms of that league at the very beginning in terms of its inclusiveness is awesome. Um, I think one other thing that uh, Professor Cash mentioned that kind of goes back to one of the conversations we had way back, you know, one of our past podcasts was access and access uh, to resources and more importantly, access to technology resources. Um, if anything, if there's anything that has been proven about this crisis with COVID is that that access is not guaranteed for anybody, much less disadvantaged communities. Um, I know here in the DC metropolitan area, in the area where I used to live at in, P in Prince George's County, Maryland, there are, three, there are three particular cities 
that are working on an initiative, you know, amongst their own populations to, you know, provide an infrastructure for just that, um, you know, for, you know, internet, public internet service for all. Um, and I think uh, that's Capitol Heights, Maryland, Sea Pleasant, and uh, I believe, um, I believe Largo or District Heights. And all three of those mayors of those small cities, the small towns are, you know, kind of working in conjunction with each other to, in combination with each other to try to, you know, build that infrastructure for things like that to happen. And the more we see, you know, these kind of, the intersectionality of those technologies blend, that's where we're going to start seeing progress in our communities because you're going to, you know, the demand is going to be so big to be able to, you know, provide those resources that at some point, you know, it's not going to be about profit. It's going to be more about the opportunity to provide as well as that. So, you know, seeing a lot of the development that we see in esports, you know, kind of has me excited for a lot of other things as well, because there's a lot of parallel in terms of how that growth is, you know, powering, you know, social and resource laden change in those communities. So, you know, just hearing about this stuff is awesome. And it's, uh, it's really exciting to see um, specific schools, specific conferences. Um, and the really cool thing about it is that you don't have to go to a large HBCU in order to be able to partake in this. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's Tougaloo or Paul Quinn or, you know, Xavier or Dillard or any number of schools that we don't necessarily associate with the SWAC or the MEAC or CIAA or the SIAC, those opportunities are there for every school that's an HBC. All it takes is, you know, administrations and, and leadership having the courage and the forethought to say, hey, look, this is a new frontier. We can benefit from it. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how that plays out. You know, I'm... Uh... I'm 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 interested. Um, Ashley, just just as a uh, logistics thing, um, the the lab that you all have set up is it twenty four? Is it twenty four computers, or are you all utilizing consoles as well, like PS four, Xbox? Computers, and to be quite frank, I haven't been on campus since um, May. Um, but they're going to be computers. They are actually being shipped right, right now. Um, we actually have in-kind chairs being shipped right now. Very exciting. Um, and we will be putting all that together. Again, we have approximately five weeks before school starts, September the 8th approximately. And yes, we have uh, actual computers and that's coming in. And we're outfitting that whole room right now is actually going to be residing. It looks like now in a in Johnson C. Smith has a beautiful STEM uh, focused building, and it will we will have a designated area in there to show off and have that outfitted. I, again, if I would have to say for HBCUs overall, we need to ensure we have proper bandwidth for teams to compete and practice. Because the students are in their dorm rooms or they're on their off-campus apartments and probably are working pretty well. But uh, unfortunately, a, a lot of our institutions do not have the internet connectivity and the sophistication across the line for a proper gaming experience. And that is a big need state for us right now, I would have to say. But I want to uh, keep focus on the HBCU piece and just share something with you that also conceptually comes to mind. I call it the convergence of sport, entertainment, and community. And when I say community, community means now education, HBCUs, corporations, and also society, community causes coming together. There is never a better opportunity right now because of the social injustice and social causes going on. So let me give you an example of that. It is my responsibility to reach out and help out just like you guys are, are providing a huge service. And that's why we're going to look at how we amplify you. There are two cats, both of them are from the DMV, and that's what makes me want so proud. I can't share too much with them because I have NDAs right now. 
One cat is developing a mobile gaming, African-American young brother, under 25. And he's developing mobile gaming right now. He's beta testing in August, launch in early uh, next year. There's another cat developing a, a basically a tracking uh, system, some type of eSport uh, performance system. That's all I can really share. And his presentation is wow. I'm going through the pro forma now because I don't understand the pro forma. I'm going to have them take me through the pro forma a little bit. But he's looking at launching next year. Both of these gentlemen from the DMV, just cats who are in the industry, and it's my responsibility to help them, to, to give them advice, mentor, and to look for financing for them. That's more to come with these two, but that's what we need to continue to promote. Um, in the area. And as you guys know, I'm from the DMV. Go, go for life. Um, yes, sir. So again, yes, sir. It, is, it, is, it is my responsibility to help out in that. So that's when I talk about the convergence of sport entertainment and society. The other part of that, when I say sport entertainment, I'm talking about individuals who are really ingrained in the lifestyle. I think last time I shared with you, Offset is a huge gamer. And you know how mm -hmm. tribalistic this industry, this, this industry is. But he is a true gamer. And dig this. His younger brother's at FAMU and is a huge into the de de design. He has an internship right now in Atlanta working on gaming design. So that's what we're talking about, ensuring that people are really getting engaged here and helping. And now you have entertainers who are in this. I bet you guys don't know um, Axiomatic, some of Axiomatic's um, owners, Michael Jordan, the owner of the Golden State Warriors, Steph Curry. You know, now hopefully these people will see the opportunity with HBCUs and people of color and investing back in this opportunity a little bit more too. So that's some of the things that I think about also. When we're talking about HBCUs, we also need to talk about community because the, the average HBCU, quite frankly, is found in the hood or that hood now is being gentrified gentrified Howard University Howard. oh did I say yeah, that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. JCSU oh yeah. did I say that but yeah, yeah that's going on but we're not going to leave our youth behind because these K through 12s that we're we're matriculating they have to go to school somewhere too and we need to empower HBCUs with the curriculums and opportunities that are going to make them more than competitive in the in society and then lastly these companies I've worked in corporate, so I know it. Be it Coca-Cola, been there. Bank of America, been there. Procter & Gamble, been there. I'm hearing all that talk now. I've been being quiet because I want to see what's going to happen in September. I want to see what happens after the elections and where people are coming. So we have to hold corporations credible. Think about it. Again, you got to remember what? The African-American um, uh, purchasing power would make us the 17th largest uh, country in, far, in, in terms of revenue of what we spend. Uh, if we were a country, we would re rank 17. And so we have to hold um, companies accountable across the industries. And I feel that the esport and gaming industry is recognizing that, that too, because think about it 83% of all African Americans uh, within a specific range, I don't know the age range, but they gain versus 72% for the general market. We over index. We under index, well, we're a lower percentage of the population, but over indexing gaming. So, you know, these are the things that we have to share with people and, and, and encourage because this is impact what we're doing um, and knowing the nuances of how we continue to grow this. So that's my little diatribe regarding sport entertainment and society, and then also empowering our communities and holding companies accountable and leveraging our sports and entertainers um, in this space. Well, let me re real quick, man. The fact that you're from the DMV, uh, uh, you, you, I mean, you, you got mad cool points from me because I'm, a, I'm a DC native, uh, born and raised. You know, born in the Greater Southeast Community Hospital. Grew up in Northwest. Went to school out in PG County, Eleanor Roosevelt. So Duval. Oh God! Okay. The cost, yeah, huh? Yeah, and uh, and I mean, the DMV is really um, it has the potential to be a real hotbed for this type of expansion in terms of the technology that we're talking about because of not only the 
you know, it's a, it's a real big seat in terms of technology, information technology, um, and new edge industry in general. So, you know, when we talk about, you know, when we talk about these things in terms of our communities, and Howard immediately comes to mind, you know, I, I, you know, I'd spent a lot of time in and around campus, you know, teaching information security in after school programs um, in the Shaw neighborhood. And first thing those kids that I've encountered from, you know, from sixth grade to, you know, starting first year of high school, um, those kids are already technically savvy innately. And the only thing is, is that the guidance to get into specific careers, the guidance to be able to take a look at how the things they normally do and take for granted, like gaming, you know, can translate into really effective changes of lifestyle and career. Um, that is something that seeing this type of growth, you know, kind of excites me in terms of how we can translate that into more opportunities for kids to see the same thing. And I know in teaching those things, I've been in the information technology field for over 20 years. I've done everything from operation support to web development to information security to you name it. So, you know, I'm, I'm what you would call a generalist. So it's essentially um, one of those things where this is a brand new frontier for the same type of kids to be able to get in on the ground level, hands on, that don't necessarily have to have the impediments to roadblocks that, you know, folks that came before them had to go through. So, you know, when we see things like that happen and develop, you know, it's really, really cool to see them develop. And you know, go ahead, Dave. I'm sorry. So I like how you how you how you brought up the the HBCU aspect of, of how this is how this is kind of coming to fruition. So, you know, we've seen lately that a lot of uh, top tier high school talent is now are now you know are now choosing HBCUs to go to instead of you know top you know PWI schools and yeah. uh, I I I, <laughs> I wonder if this is also a way to kind of you know take take the 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 black e athletes if you will and you know kind of push them towards HBCUs and you know the reason I say that is so you know every once in a while I'll I'll get a comment about, you know, why are you called the black techie? You know, why not just the techies? You know, isn't that isn't that divisive? Or aren't you, you know, they are, if they were white techies, then you'd be like, oh, that's racist. It is. But <laughs> but the, the reason why we call ourselves the black techies is because in the tech space, in the IT space, in the, the wider cons consumer technology world, you don't see us. Like, when I, uh, when I first joined... Uh, the federal government, I was shocked to see that most of the people, well, not, well a good chunk of the people that I work with, I, I'm a network engineer. So a lot, a lot of the network, network engineers that I work with were black. Well, in fact, one of them was a black woman, and she was like one of like the top senior network engineer. Like she, she knew her stuff. Like, and she, she knew how to design diagrams with like the best precision in the way. But, uh, <laughs> but I get my, 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 my point is that uh, th this is an opportunity for people who didn't think that this is something they should do. N now, now is their chance. Oh, you know, if, if you're, uh, you, you mentioned that most HBCUs or all HBCUs really <laughs> are in the hood. That's true, right? So if you live in the hood and you, and you, you know, you, you look across the street at this at Howard, and you see that oh they have this esports program where you know I get to learn how to the business aspect or uh, I I get to learn how to participate in playing Call of Duty oh I like Call of Duty I'm pretty good at Call of Duty oh I'm pretty good at Halo why not right well so so this is this is one of those uh, moments I think where we can get all the people who would have went to one of those top tier PWIs, right? And now we can kind of shuffle them toward towards HBCUs, not only because of the the cultural aspect, but I mean, you you get 
and, and obviously there's nothing wrong with going to a predominantly white school. It's nothing wrong. Don't 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 not don't, at all. Not at all. And don't yeah. don't even if the for those who are thing. listening, yeah. please don't don't get that. I, I interned at Penn State. It was the best internship ever. And they almost had me <laughs> going there. That's why I went <laughs> but, to uh, school. Why they almost yeah. had me. Well, but uh but what I'm saying is you you get so much there there's so much of of black culture that you get at an HBCU that you just can't get anywhere else. So you combine the richness of an HBCU, the culture aspect of the HBCU, combined with esports and all of the other extracurricular things that you can do, you can, now you kind of get the whole thing. And then that lifts the entire black community up at the same time. And now we're competing. Now we're we're um yeah we're competing at the same level as the you know the larger school. So I don't know. I, I think that yeah. this is a really big moment for black athletes, black e athletes to kind of, you know, look at their options and say, hey, all right, I was going to go to, you know, Ohio State, but, you know, Johnson C. Smith over there, they got this esports program. And I like esports, you know, you know, so I'm just, I don't know. Yeah, and it's cheaper, you're, probably. You're right. I mean, <laughs> I'm just saying. It's, it's a cultural thing. <laughs> And first of all, diversity is fine. It's just being e equality is the thing. We all just want equality. We all just want to be respected. It goes back to the golden rule: treat others the way you want to treat you. You know, you want to be treated. But the one other thing I wanted to share um, before we might get to a time constraint, you guys will keep me happy, uh, keep me close here, is that there's another big event coming up in a couple of days. It's called the HBCU Africa Homecoming. This is the second or third year of the event. And of course, we have to do it virtual. Last year was held in Accra, Accra if I'm saying that properly, Ghana, at Accra, the University yeah. of Accra. And uh, HBCU graduate, his name is Kwabin Boatnang, is doing it and one of the main people activating it. I'm going to be on, I'm going to be moderating one panel on sport entertainment. And then I'll be sitting on the uh, eSport panel. It's, it's July 23rd through the 25th. You can go online and register. Again, HBCU Africa Homecoming. And we just don't talk about tech. We talk about all industries and opportunities. And think about the opportunity to uplift the African diaspora. That is what the goal is. Whether it's FinTech, cybersecurity, education, health and wellness, esports, entertainment, sports. And you guys mentioned Makur Maker, if I'm saying his name correct, the Kenyan yep. Australian brother who's going to wear H U, you know? Yeah. So and again, that opportunity and his goal said, if not me, then who? If not now, then when? That's basically what he said. And so to your point, I hope that people understand this opportunity and the impact that it has in the diaspora. And, and moving forward, and again, it is nothing against PWIs at all, but you know, I'll never go. I'll go back to the, a different world. And it was the episode where Whitley talked about why she attended an HBCU, of how it embraces you and emboldens you, it helps develop you. And I get you don't get that at a PWI. I guarantee. You. I've been to one, maybe at the graduate level, and I can tell you it was night and day. So again, I'm not trying to discount it, but you have to remember the experiences you get. And a lot of times I hear a lot of people who've gone to PWIs is like they're playing um, linebacker. They're in that linebacker pose because their head's on a swivel. You don't know what to think, what to do sometimes, but at least you have a more accepting environment. So we're going to continue empowerment. Look at how far we have come, guys, about if you look at your HBCU eSport gaming conversations from last year this time to now. Look how far we've come in just – this year during a pandemic in yeah. seven months. This is warp speed stuff to us and we're gonna to continue to move forward. Um, and I'm, I give props to everybody who's out there doing something in this space, who's doing it genuinely and morally for the right purposes in HBCUs across the conferences, um, the industry leaders, and the people who are, are helping educate uh, like myself. Lord knows, I know I don't know it all, that's why I talk to people like you. When I'm the smart, if I'm the smartest person in the room, it's time to find a new room. So I, I appreciate what you guys are doing. And again, I'm shouting out to all your audience. We're getting these cats to the next level. I'm gonna do what I can 
because what they have is not a black voice, it's not a white voice. They're espousing for industry growth. They're just focusing on the opportunity of the underserved. So just try to be objective in thought and understand that. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. If we all do that more, I think we'll come at a, at a different spot for acceptance. Yeah, and that, I think that's a, um, mantra, that's a mantra for life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, I, and I just wanted to add this real, uh, to piggyback off of what uh, Professor Cash just mentioned in terms of um, McCour Maker and, and you know, his, his groundbreaking decision. You know, for those of y'all out there that don't know, my side hustle, I'm a college basketball contributor for Busting Brackets for uh, Fan Sided. And uh, one of the first articles I had to write um, had to do with McCore Maker's impact on MEAC basketball. I cover MEAC basketball, SWAC basketball in the University of Maryland. And the intersectionality of those kind of moments whether it's esports, whether it's regular sports, when one of us makes a decision like that, it really, it really magnifies how important that intersectionality is. I know in my Twitter feeds, I you know I spend a lot of time on Twitter these days because you know I, I'm following the news in terms of college basketball, in addition to the news as it associates with this podcast and technology. So <laughs> I spend a lot of my time. Um, you know, in my side hustle time, <laughs> I, I'm not going to say that for my regular job because uh, I still work in IT. You guys listen. Uh, yeah. You know, I, yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I'm doing my work. But essentially, you know, the intersectionality of those types of moments is big. I know when when Maker made that, you know, made that commitment and Kenny Blakeney um you know, we you know, Kenny Blakeney. I mean, those are folks that are from the DMV know who Kenny Blakeney is. He played at DeMatha, um, even though he kind of went to the evil empire at Duke. But we, we can't talk about that. You know, we'll, we'll <laughs> forgive him. But um, you know, he and a, and a whole bunch of cast that are on that on that staff at Howard, you know, have kind of leveraged new media, just like a lot of HBCUs are doing right now. Same thing with um, brother at Morgan State. Used to be at a, on um, on University of Maryland basketball's ro- um, coaching uh, coaching roster, uh, Kevin Brooks. He's brought in a heavy recruiting class, and all of that stuff is kind of being all of that stuff is kind of intertwined in a way because of the technology that we're dealing with. Um, in a, in our realm of esports, that I mean that type of exposure. It's, it's, that type of exposure is the same type of exposure that's powering the interest in esports among HBCU institutions, HBCU supporters. I mean, I've been approached by so many people since we started doing the podcast and since we started talking about specific things like esports and, and HBCUs and being involved in the industry um, that it, I never expected to see that type of interest before, before we started this podcast and before we started really really exploring those possibilities. So, you know, the fact that those things kind of, you know, bleed and blend into each other in terms of that type of intersectionality is huge. And it's something that is one of those byproducts that could really be beneficial for HBCUs, Black community at large, and in terms of another platform for that type of leveling of the playing field. And it's, it's big stuff. And I mean, you guys are absolutely right. We, did, we It's hard for us to say, you know, it's going to be history in the moment because we're seeing all these things develop and we don't know what that path is going to be. But there are some indicators and those indicators are big. And you're right. I mean, it was not just McCour. It was a brother at University of Texas. Yeah. I went to grad school. He's going to tech, a baseball player going to Texas Southern. Um, and then a couple other football players. And when we're talking about industry, also uh, to focus more again on the esport piece and what some of your avid listeners might be listening to, I would also have to make sure that I mentioned Beasley uh, Media Group, Beasley Esports, and Checkpoint XP. Uh, I listen to Checkpoint XP here in Charlotte, it's an esport gaming uh, radio station 
comes on in the morning, uh, Saturday mornings, 8 to 9. They're revamping some things. But we're in conversation with them. They understand African Americans consume more radio than any other segment. They feel there was an underserved opportunity. So that's another area that I can talk a little bit about. But there will be more to come. So again, um, augmented reality, virtual reality. I remember when I was working for Learfield IMG, we brought this up maybe 10 years ago. They could not wrap their heads around it. Well, virtual reality, augmented reality is basically here. And now the next impact is going to be on eSport gaming. You talked about remote before and being COVID resistant. Wait till we get virtual and augmented reality integrated into gaming in a much more sophisticated manner right now. Uh, I can't wait. And I mean, that's where my conversations want to be with the industry right now. And then how we can start preparing our youth and HBCUs can get prepared for this area also. Yeah, yeah, I, this is honestly like right like right now I like, I'm almost tempted to like re-enroll and be like <laughs> let me <laughs> let me do something. But uh you know, I got scholarships, online scholarships. I'm just, you know, let me let me uh <laughs> put a yeah. throw it up there. But uh no, go go ahead. I so I think we might uh go ahead and try to wind this down, but go right. uh I'll I'll let you go ahead and and make a make your statement. No, no, I'm good. I'm just thankful to Black Techies and everything that you guys do in this space to help empower the message in general and amplify the opportunity with the African-American community. And for all the listeners out there, first of all, I'm a Christian. So regardless of all your listeners out there, you are my brothers and sisters in faith, regardless of how you feel, because I love you from the heart, not just the head. And just, again, try to keep an open mind and be objective Follow the golden rule. Let's just grow together in a communal fashion. That's what I would ask. Within the eSport gaming piece, uh, again, we will continue to educate and advocate and empower those people who want to be in this industry. And I hope as a collective, everybody can see the growth. And there's room out here for everybody to have a portion. We don't need a, or a southeast, a Southwest Wharf mentality, crab in a barrel, <laughs> a crab in a, <laughs> crab in a crocus sack mentality. We, there's yeah. a, enough out here for all of us. So I look, I cannot wait for another more big news. I think it should launch before school starts, but um, I will keep you guys posted. There's more great HBCU eSport uh, and gaming news to come. I just have to sit on it right now or they'd have to kill me. I'd say it and they'd have to kill me. So I don't want to do that. But thank you. And I'm, I'm going to close my pie hole here and let these illustrious hosts um, lead us out. Well, I th <laughs> well, I think. Yeah, um, her, yeah go ahead. Her, cause I'll go ahead and close out. <laughs> well, yeah, I think it, it will. I'd be remiss to not extend a, a, a real big thank you and a word of appreciation for Professor Cash for you know um appearing on our show um like i said if anybody has listened to the black techies over our existence you know we are about as enthusiastic about hbcus and their legacy and their development and what they mean to people in general as anybody out there you know if you're out there whether you're a graduate whether you went to school at hbcu but didn't graduate whether you you know supported HBCUs from afar, it shows like this that, you know, we, you know, it's that audience that we, we do this show for because that's how important historically black colleges and universities are to the fabric of African-American communities. Um, Esports in terms of the, you know, the, the t being the tip of the spear of a new tech, new billion dollar type of industry for black folk in general, I feel the same way about. And the fact that we've been able to have this dialogue um, over the course of two shows with, um, and you know, I, I know this is gonna sound kind of cliche, but you know, Professor Cash is, is a trailblazer. You know, Johnson C. Smith is a program um, that they are, they are essentially the tip of the spear when it comes to um, leading the way and blazing a path for HBCU involvement in this industry. And we really, really appreciate having your input and your perspective on the show and, you know, an industry that, 
exactly like you said earlier, it's like the Wild West. It's going to be, it's going to be just as big as a as a gold rush, you know, in in certain in certain things. So for those folks listening, uh, thank you for listening to us. Uh, we're going to continue to bring you, you know, content just like this. Uh, we're going to have more, you know, experts, more perspectives, all sorts of things. And again, to Johnson C. Smith, to Professor Cash, you know, to the folks that are heading over your department and doing that curriculum, thank you and keep up the good work. I thank you guys and blessings again to you and to all your listeners. And all stay right. safe, of course. Yes, definitely. Wear masks. Stuff is real. Oh, yeah. One other thing. Um, if you're an HBC, HBC supporter and you want to get a mask, all you got to do is hop online. There's so many folks selling masks for schools. You can get one for your school. Shout out to the button to the biz, black business owners that are doing it. So, yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. You take care. All right.